I'm going to hit start record. So we're going to record this. Uh, hi, my name is Doug Cluck. I'm with uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, National Centers for Environmental Information. Uh, coming to you from Kansas City, Missouri. And today our topic is uh, of climate change basically in the Missouri River. Uh, we're going to talk to four different speakers. Uh, one, uh, Kevin Lau, who is the first speaker from the National Weather Service and the River Forecast Center uh, for the Missouri Basin. Uh, then we're going to talk to Mike Swenson with the Army Corps of Engineers out of Omaha. Uh, we're going to follow that with Brian Fuchs from the National Drought Mitigation Center out of Lincoln, Nebraska. And then we're going to finish up with Andy Hoyle. Um, each one is going to, Andy Hoyle from NOAA out of Boulder, and each one of them is going to, uh, they want to tell you who, where they are and what they do. That's fine too. Uh, I do want f folks to know that I won't be manning, if you will, or watching the chat, but I will be watching the question section. So as you listen to this, feel free to comment or ask questions uh, like we do on our monthly calls. I don't know if all of you are on those, but we have monthly calls and what monthly webinars and if you have a question just ask it in there we'll get to it at the end of the call uh technically we go to 3 30 central time we have that much time blocked off if there is that many if there are that many questions uh and interest in the subject and um, i think all the speakers are, are are willing to stick around for that extra half hour if we need it if we don't we'll just quit um so on that note kevin Lau uh, is going to start start the uh, presentations. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the trends in flooding and precipitation from a river forecast center uh, perspective. So, Kevin, why don't you take it away and I'll be quiet. Thank you. Okay, Doug, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Okay, well, thanks. And uh, you did hit the record, right? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Doug said, my name is Kevin Lau. I'm with the National Weather Service, Missouri Basin River Forecast Center, uh, also located in Kansas City. I'm going to uh, give an over, overview of, of uh, precipitation trends and, uh, and flooding trends, or at least hydrologic activity trends as we see it from the River Forecast Center. And for some reason, my screen didn't change. Oh, there you go. So first of all, I'll be talking about precipitation. With this first plot, um, I'm plotting the annual precipitation total as averaged across the entire Missouri River Basin, the entire 530,000 square miles of the Missouri River Basin by year for the period of record from 1895 through 2022. And over this 128 year period, you might uh, see a slight upwards trend of about nine tenths of an inch uh, in total rain per century, or roughly a uh, tenth of an inch per decade. So that's the trend when you look uh, over the uh, entire period of record. And this information can be accessed um, through the web uh, at the National Centers of Environmental Information, and that link is in the lower right-hand corner of this and the future slide. So you can look at this information yourself. With the next four slides, I'll be uh, plotting the same sort of precipitation data, uh, but by season. And with this slide, I'm plotting the three month winter total precipitation across the basin. Uh, winter precipitation totals and winter uh, for us is December, January, and February for all the years between 1895 and last year. And that shows a slight decrease of about seven one hundredths of an inch per century or about a hundredth of an inch per decade. That's the downward trend for winter precipitation. The next slide, I'll be looking at spring, and spring is March, April, May. So I'm looking at the March, April, May totals for all years in the period of record, and um, that would show that we're seeing an upward trend of about 0.6 inches per century, or 0.06, or six hundredths of an inch per decade. Here's summertime precipitation for the period of record, and it's basically flatlined. So no increase and no decrease perceptible uh, with summertime rainfall. 
And finally, in the fall, we see an upward trend of about 35 hundredths of an inch per century or three tenths of an inch or three hundredths, excuse me, three hundredths of a tenth uh, of an inch climb per decade, fall precipitation. And we often like to look at the most recent 30 years, not just this period of record, but we like to look at the last 30 years or the recent, most recent 30 years uh, to see how uh, recent patterns are emerging. So with the next five slides, I'm gonna be looking at the same basin-wide total precipitation by year, but only for the last 30 years, from 1993 to today. And in this first slide, it shows the total precipitation falling across the basin is showing a downward trend of about four tenths of an inch per decade. Now, I'll hasten to acknowledge that this would seem obvious since we're starting with the big flood year of 1993. But I also want to uh, uh, point out that this does include the incredibly dry year of 2012. So 1993 is not driving the, the whole train on this downward trend. With this next slide, I'll be looking at seasons, the season of winter, again from 1993 through today. And we see an upward trend of about a tenth of an inch. Spring, we see an upward ten, uh, trend again of about a tenth of an inch. And in the summer from 1993 until today, a trend of about a half an inch per decade, a downward trend. And finally, in the fall, last 30 years, fall precipitation has a downward trend of about 16 one hundredths of an inch per decade. So in summary then, looking at uh, both the annual and the uh, 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 seasonal trends for both the 128 year period of record, as well as the most uh, recent 30 years. And to, uh, to highlight uh, negative trends are highlighted in red. Again, all that information can be found in that link at the bottom. Okay, now I'm gonna be looking at uh, trends in flooding or probably more accurately, trends in hydrologic activity. Now the USGS has a very nice website application at the link shown in the lower left-hand corner of this uh, graphic. And this website by the USGS provides a look at stream flow trends over various time periods. Uh, one can also find details on how uh, the USGS conducted their analysis. And for our purposes today, I wanted to show just a couple of their slides looking at the period of record 1966 through 2015. For this 50 year period, the USGS study revealed a general upward trend in stream flows in the eastern portion of the basin and a downward trend in the mountainous west. With this next slide, we're focusing on uh, peak discharges, instantaneous peaks or crests. So we're not look, looking at average flows or volumes like we were in the last slide. We're now just looking at peaks. And again, we see an upward trend in peaks uh, in the extreme eastern portion of the Missouri Basin, as well as in the Colorado Rockies, but a downward trend in, um, in stage crests uh, across much of the Northern Plains and the Northern Rockies. Now, a year ago, uh, our office, the National Weather Service Missouri Basin River Forecast Center, we recomputed our long-term normals, and they, they span about 30 years. And this provided us the unique opportunity to compare the former 30 year period to the most recent 30 year uh, period as far as normals go in terms of volumes as well as peak flows, sort of like what the USGS did. And so our analysis revealed a significant uptick in stream flow volumes in the Dakotas and to a lesser degree, an upward trend in volumes across the entire Eastern portion of the basin. With this next slide, I'm going to be looking at peak discharges and the trends there. And so um, we, we know the upward trend again in the Dakotas with regard to instantaneous or peak discharges and a scattering of, of increased peaks across the remainder of the basin. Now, one way to gauge if high water events are becoming more common um, over the past few, year, few years is to review the number of forecasts that our um, our office issues. And so this graph reveals a growing trend in the number of river forecasts 
issued by our office over the past 20 years. Now, mind you, not all of these forecasts led to an actual flood event, but it is evidence that we are getting busier. We're becoming more hydrologically active with, within the Missouri River Basin. Now, this last graphic of mine shows the number of stage records that have been broken at locations within the Missouri Basin that the National Weather Service forecasts. So this is not an exhaustive list. It's not all the, the gauging stations within the basin, simply the stations that we monitor and issue a forecast for in the event of high water. And so a general trend is really not discernible here as far as are we breaking more crests? Is there an upward trend in, in, uh, in records being set? But it is interesting to note that in very big years, in very big flood years, the number of stage records broken seems to be increasing. I would uh, point out that in 2019, we broke roughly twice the number of records set back in the last big year of 2011. And so here's a, uh, a summary slide of how hydrologic activity seems to be trending uh, from the point of view of the River Forecast Center. Uh, but for the sake of time, I won't dwell on this um, on this graphic. But with that, I will turn it back over to Doug. Thank you, Kevin. Um, now, again, I encourage folks if they have any questions or uh, comments about anything they've seen, um, even if it, you don't understand what the heck Kevin's talking about, we'd love to hear that. <laughs> But uh, um, let me see here. Our next speaker is uh, Mike Swenson from the Army Corps of Engineers. And you can see from this title, Runoff Trends and Reservoir Levels. Take it away, Mike. OK, can you hear me? And can you see my slide there, Doug? Uh, yes, on both. Thank you. OK. OK, thanks, Doug. And again, yeah, Mike Swenson with the Corps of Engineers, uh, Missouri River Basin Water Management. <clears throat> I'm gonna give just a little background on our reservoirs and then talk about historic reservoir levels and runoff trends. Are you there, Mike? Looks like you uh, you got you self muted yourself somehow. There you go. Are you back? Okay. Yeah. Not sure what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have here the Missouri River Basin. Uh, we have the six large dams on the main stem of the Missouri, Fort Peck in Montana, Garrison in North Dakota, Owyhee, Big Bend and Fort Randall in South Dakota, and then Gavin's Point on the border of South Dakota and Nebraska. Uh, the projects are operated to meet the congressionally authorized project purposes that are shown in the bottom blue box there. There's also the bank stabilization and navigation project. Uh, it's basically the navigation channel that extends from Sioux City, Iowa to the mouth of the Missouri near St. Louis. Sioux City is the first downstream target location below Gavin's Point, and that's where we typically measure the upper basin runoff that I'm going to talk about later. Also added the Herman, Missouri uh, location on this map, and I'll reference that later too with respect to downstream runoff. Okay, the six reservoirs are operated together as a system, and we often use system storage for regulation decisions. So this represents all the storage of the six dams together with the associated uh, different zone allocations. We have the permanent pool, which is the minimum needed for water supply and hydropower, basically. The carryover multiple use zone is designed to serve the authorized purposes at reduced levels during extended drought periods. The annual flood control multiple use zone is the preferred zone. We basically like to start at the base of that zone each year, capture water during the high runoff periods, 
and then use the water to meet the authorized purposes and return to the base of the zone prior to the start of next year's runoff. And then the exclusive flood control zone, and as the name implies, it is used for extreme flood events. Okay, so we have three runoff components in the basin, plain snow, mountain snow, and rainfall. The plain snowpack typically melts and produces runoff in March and April, uh, though in some years we get it earlier, like in February. Um, during the months of March and April, we typically get about 25% of the annual runoff in the upper basin. The mountain snowpack typically melts in May through July, and during those three months, we get about 50% of the annual runoff. So on average, about 75% of the annual runoff happens in the five month period from March to July. Okay, so now this slide shows the annual runoff above Sioux City for the period of record, which goes back to 1898. The tan bars are basically the four long-term droughts that we've had in the Missouri River Basin. And then I've numbered the highest 10 runoff years on here. We have 125 years of record, but as you can see that nine out of 10 of the highest runoff years have occurred since 1978. And we can actually take that a little bit further even because 12 out of the 13 highest runoffs have occurred since 1975. Um, and this recent runoff trend of high runoff years was actually studied previously uh, by NOAA for the Corps. Okay, this slide shows the uh, uh, system storage. The reservoirs were filled and began operating as a system starting in 1967. So that's, that's why this chart starts then. You can see the pattern I talked about earlier where a lot of the years start near the base of the annual flood control zone, and then we capture runoff during the high runoff periods, and then return near the base of the zone uh, prior to the start of the next year. Um, I should note that the zones do change some over time due to sedimentation. There hasn't been any change in total flood storage, but we've seen some loss in the carryover zone and the permanent pool, and that's why the lines appear to be uh, slightly slanted here. Uh, a few of the highest runoff years went into the exclusive zone, like 1997, 2011, uh, 2018, and 2019, both uh, used the exclusive flood control zone. And then you can also see on this uh, system storage chart the impacts of long-term drought periods. For example, 1988 to 1992 drought period, uh, we dropped system storage, then we had a big uh, recovering storage in 1993. Uh, the most significant drought since, since the system was filled was 2000 to 2008, roughly. It was during that drought that we reached the historical minimum storage that you can see the red line going across there. It remains to be seen, you know, now if we are in one of these multi year drought periods. You know, we have seen some recovery in storage. You can see that right at the far right of the plot. And we have seen a little bit better runoff this year. But again, kind of remains to be seen, uh, you know, what, what this will turn out like in a year or two. Okay, I wanted to go back just a little bit to the runoff. Uh, this slide here is basically the same annual runoff data, but it divided up into the reaches now. So the top graph includes Fort Peck and Garrison, which is where the mountain snow runs into. Most of the runoff in a typical year comes from these mountain snowpack reaches. The remaining reaches uh, from Oahe to Sioux City are shown on the bottom. On the top graph, we can see there's some variability there. For example, 2011 stands out. However, on the bottom graph, we see much more variability and more of the higher runoff events in recent years, particularly in that Sioux City reach. You can see uh, like 2019 stands out quite a bit with uh, really high runoff that year. And this is my last slide here, uh, which now includes some additional runoff below the reservoir system. 
The blue bar again is the same runoff above Sioux City that we saw earlier. And now the red bar represents runoff from Sioux City to Herman. Our data here only uh, goes back to 1958. The lower part of the basin tends to get more rain. Uh, so in many cases, the red bars are higher than the blue bars. Um, Kevin Lau earlier mentioned the 1993 sort of flood and precip event. So the two highest bars we see here are 1993 and 2019. 1993 was the 10th highest runoff above Sioux City, but there was storage available in the reservoirs that you you saw in the earlier slide since it followed the drought period that we had. Uh, however, there was a major event downstream of the reservoirs and that's why you see that uh, bar so high in 1993. And then 2019, which was the second highest runoff on record above Sioux, Still Sioux City, excuse me, there was still more runoff between Sioux City and Herman that that year than there was in the upstream part of the uh, reservoir system. Another thing to point out here is that some upstream drought years, like a 2007 or a 2008, or even a, you know just a dry year like 1973, were very wet in the lower basin. And that's kind of just to point out that the basin is very large and it could be uh, dry in the upstream part of the reservoirs while still having flooding on the lower part of the river. And that concludes what I have. I will turn it back to Doug. Thank you, Mike, uh, and the Corps of Engineers for that. Um, just a couple uh, couple notes here. Uh, the next speaker is Andy Hoyle, who's gonna talk about the potential future uh, of the basin. And as you can see by his uh, title there, and I'm not going to steal any of his thunder, except I'm going to say the last three speakers, thank you all for your time and your effort, by the way, um, really portrayed sort of sometimes conflicting information. And, and yep, we see that too. Um, is it drying? Is it wetting? Uh, what season are we talking about? I mean, these are, these are kind of hard questions. Not that Andy's gonna have all the answers, by the way, but what I'm saying is Eastern Dakota seem to be getting a little wetter. Uh, uh, you, you go further west, um, maybe maybe a little drier in some of the stream flow, uh, maybe in the precipitation. But when you add in temperature, as Brian said, or evapotranspiration, which includes temperature through you know evaporation and transpiration through plants, um, you get a little bit of a different story. So what are rising temperatures, what do rising temperatures actually mean in the long run? So I'm gonna stop there, Andy, before I say any more and ruin everything. So thank you and Andy, uh, please take it away and thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Doug, and thank you for the invitation and thanks to our colleagues uh, for giving great presentations. I think what I'm gonna present on uh, has a lot of synergy uh, to what was presented and helped really set the stage for um, some of the conclusions that we can't come to uh, regarding Missouri River flows. So I'm Andy Hoyle. I'm a research meteorologist at the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory, where we consider questions on predictions, predictability, projections of hydroclimatic extremes. And what we're examining here is the high Missouri River flows um, in the context of climate change. And our principal conclusion here is that those high ri Missouri River flows were not caused by climate change. Uh, this is based on a paper in the Journal of Hydrometeorology, so this is a good example of uh, a good time for me to uh, call out my colleagues who helped work on this with me, um, Quan Xiaowei, Maya Robinson, and Marty Hurling, who has recently retired from the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory. And my email is uh, on this slide right here, so you can reach out to me uh, directly or within the chat box here, and we'll try to get to your questions. So one thing that I'll do here is I'll begin with the conclusions. And there were three principal conclusions and then from there work into the evidence basis um, for how we reach those conclusions. The first here is that we identified runoff increases in a recent 30 year period, 1990 to 2019, compared to a prior period, 1960 to 1989. And it goes without saying they were caused by precipitation increases. How else would you get a runoff increase? Uh, what we also concluded here is that anthropogenic effects 
they mainly would have contributed to a decrease in the runoff due to warming. So what we saw here is these increases in precipitation were due to natural variations of the climate in this recent period compared to an earlier period. And then future runoff, declines in runoff by 2050 are most likely as warming increases. Does it mean hard and fast we're going to have runoff decreases? No, that's the most likely outcome. There are some scenarios in which we could see flatlined or perhaps even slightly increased runoff, but the effect of climate change would be to decrease runoff. So here's where I'll get into our historical context. So you've seen some perspectives similar to this um, in the prior slides and prior presentations. So this is the Missouri River Basin, which sits as the largest uh, hydrologic catchment within the United States and North America. What we've done here is to separate the basin into two, an upper basin and a lower basin. And these are based on smaller hydrologic units within here and how rivers and water, is, water flows through these hydrological units. So these really follow the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, uh, perspective here in which runoff that is generated in the upper basin flows through Sioux City, Iowa. And in the lower basin, it flows through Herman, Missouri. And this is data cor courtesy of the U.S. Army Corps. So uh, Ryan Larson, uh, who is our contact there, has provided this data. And it's the same data that uh, was presented on in a prior presentation. So what we found is in this recent period, 1990 to 2019, compared to that prior period, 1960 to 1989, upper basin runoff increased by 6%, whereas in the lower basin, it increased by 17%. So very, very large increases in runoff in this recent compared to a prior period. And we're getting a lot of questions here whether this was climate change. And of course, as I indicated before, we don't have any evidence for that. And, but we had to do the study anyways to, to really come to that and determine that. So the precipitation increases were quite large across much of the United States in that recent compared to the prior period. So that's what's shown here on the left is a relative difference between those two periods. And at the same time on the right, these are temperature differences in absolute values. Uh, what's really noteworthy here is that the central and eastern United States received a lot more precipitation in the recent 30 years compared to the prior 30. So it goes without saying runoff and stream flow and really water resources across many of these areas have increased in the recent compared to the prior climate. And meanwhile, we've also seen a warming within the basin, but that warming in the Missouri Basin is actually quite a, a bit uh, lower than other areas of the country, particularly that of the Southwest, where, there's, where there has been a drying uh, as well. So now getting into the anthropogenic uh, effects to date and showing and demonstrating that anthropogenic effects had mainly contributed to a decrease in runoff due to warming and that the precipitation increases that led to the runoff increases were due to natural variations of our hydroclimate. So what we do, um, scientists like myself, in trying to parse out relevant physical mechanisms and scenarios for the current and future climate is to use climate models. And the best analogy that I have for using climate models is that they are our laboratory. So somebody like myself, I sit at my computer and I code up the computer and I take a look at what results come out. These climate model simulations allow us and they afford us large samples from which we're able to test sensitivities within the climate and see how different behaviors affect certain variables like runoff. So what we did here is we used, we used five different climate models and those five climate models are run repeatedly many times from which we can generate these large samples. And then we go in there and then we start to test the sensitivities like recent compared to past climate runoff increases in the upper and lower basin. So what's shown here is a fraction or a likelihood of increases in the, P, the, the recent versus the past climate for neither upper or lower basin, the upper basin only, the lower basin only, and for both basins. So these orange bars right here, they indicate the likelihood of seeing runoff decreases in both basins. Stated here is runoff increases in neither basin, but that's essentially what this is. Runoff decreases in both basin. And what you're seeing here is that this was the overwhelming outcome from all these climate model ensembles that we use. That's the most likely outcome. That's the climate change effect. The climate change effect in this case was to decrease runoff in the upper and lower basin. 
What history served us, however, is we saw runoff increases in the recent compared to the past climate in both basins. This is the purple line. What you can see here is this was a very low likely outcome, somewhere between about a 5% chance of happening to like a 22% chance of happening, really dwarfed by the opposite or the total opposite. That is a decrease in runoff in the upper and lower basin. So we probed this and we decided that we wanted to look at the relevant physical mechanisms related to this. So what did we do? Well, these plots right here show for the upper basin and the lower basin for these different climate models we used is we're basically showing box plots. What box plots show is they show some su summary statistics about how runoff was distributed through time in a recent compared to a past climate. The white line right here is the median value of these climate model simulations, basically the most likely outcome. And what they're indicating is that there is a decrease in runoff as a most likely outcome in the recent compared to the past climate. That right there is the climate change effect. That is, climate change in all of its glory would have decreased runoff of these values, say between about five and 15 or so percent. As you get further away from these central values, you get into these lighter colors. And these lighter colors, they indicate that they're within the model range, the possible or plausible outcomes. But the further away you get from that median, the more unlikely those outcomes are. The dot right here is what we actually observed. For the upper basin, it was about a 6% increase. In the lower basin, it was about a 17% increase. And you can see placing those observed values within the context of the model, you can see exactly how unlikely having runoff increases in the recent compared to the past climate in both basins was. This is an exceptionally low likelihood outcome that could only be explained by natural variations of the climate, which can serve us extreme values from time to time. Now, the reason for that, it was because of precip increases. So same perspective here, we're looking at the summary statistics, basically box plots indicated by these different shaded colors. And you can see placing the observed estimate in the context of these climate model simulations that the observed estimates were, they were way at the tails, meaning that they were a very low likelihood outcome. So we needed exceptional precipitation that we observed in order to bump runoff to those exceptional values that we observed in the recent compared to the past climate. So that is to say, what we saw right here were exceptional precipitation increases that counteracted the effect of climate change to produce runoff that was higher in the recent compared to the past climate. I won't dwell on this too much. Temperatures. Uh, the increases in temperature did play a role, which would have otherwise decreased runoff, but this is really a precip story here. Now, these maps right here, what we can do is we can take a look at the climate model simulations and try to get a better perspective in terms of how much precipitation would we have needed when we had these increases in runoff. And that's what's being shown right here. Increases in precipitation leading to an increase in runoff that counteracted the effect of warmer temperatures. So for those climate model realizations in which we saw precipitation increases or we saw runoff increases in the Missouri Basin, we saw these big precip increases. Whereas for those remaining climate model realizations, when we didn't see a runoff increase, when we actually saw decreases or virtually no change, we didn't see a precipitation change. And the difference between the two indicates that we really needed precipitation increases about six to eight to 10% in order to counteract those changes in temperature. So what does the future hold? Uh, this is the, the million dollar question that everybody's asking here because of the importance to water resources, the importance to how much water we have for things like irrigation and recreation and drinking and hydroelectric power among many others. Well, runoff in the future is most likely to decrease by 2050 as warming increases. Now, I don't wanna dwell on this too much here, but the moral of the story here is you see these lines, especially the orange line, that is below 0%. And what these indicate is that a runoff decline or decrease, say by 2050, is the most likely outcome. So the good run of luck that we have seen in terms of copious precipitation leading to copious runoff, that is not a low, a high likelihood outcome. That's rather low likelihood outcome. And that by 2050, runoff decreases are most likely and what we can expect going forward. 
So with that, I will finish there and thank Doug and all of other other speakers and everybody else for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. And um, I know that's a pretty complex uh, bunch of information that Andy gave us, but Andy did a really good job. Why don't you keep your presentation up, Andy? Because um, you never know. Um, someone may um, may want to ask a question about it or something. Um, sure, I can. Yeah, put it. Yeah, go ahead and put it back up. Um, so, one question I have before we get to the questions is: It did do. So, one of the things that Kevin showed. Oh well, I've actually everybody showed with these these extremes in runoff happening more frequently lately doesn't necessarily mean. I, I'm sort of making a statement, but I want some reaction to it from anybody on the panel. Actually, um, these increase these these really high peaks in runoff don't necessarily equate to one higher annual runoff, and um, and I think someone else. Oh yeah, uh, Brian brought up the fact that we're going to have we're going to see some of these more extreme precipitation events, which we've seen across the country, to be honest. Um, we're going to see more of those with longer periods of dryness in between, or yeah, I think we mean dryness by that. Is is Did your findings fit into that scenario at all? Did you look at peak discharge and all that kind of business? And, and really, anybody want to comment on that? Andy, you start. Yeah, yeah, I can go. Um, there's actually a slide that I had left off, and the reason it's a little bit complicated. Um, and it's got all the bells and whistles. So this is similar to a picture that um, was shown previously. It essentially shows uh, changes in runoff through time. So year-to-year -year variations for October to September runoff. And you're seeing this here with the bars. So this here was our recent climate in our study. This here was our past climate. What you can see is that really what won the day in terms of increasing runoff in the recent compared to the past climate were some exceptional runoff years that were caused by exceptional precipitation years. You can see these huge peaks. So what's being um, claimed sort of in our community and, and in society is that extremes are really the name of the game. That is being, um, that, that's being supported by this plot right here where we're seeing annual precipitation extremes leading to annual runoff extremes and these annual runoff extremes then lead to multi-decades of runoff extremes um we have a question about your model the, the models that you used um and it's more of a statement but it's a question so the expected 2050 ex so by i'm sorry let me reread uh so the ex so by 2050 the models expect this, the same climate models are, are saying it's getting drier did not correctly depict the occurrences discussed so far. You, you understand what he's saying? He's saying, how can we trust these five models if they weren't right? I think that's what you're saying so far. In other words, what, what actually occurred was wetter although the models say it's going to be drier. So why do we think uh, by 2050, it actually is going to be drier? <clears throat> yeah, there's a, there's a large range of possible outcomes within the climate that can play out. And low likelihood outcomes do happen. Uh, there's a reason for why we go ahead and we do this and we do these large ensembles where we can sample the possible outcomes. So it wouldn't look at this in terms of uh, oh, our climate model didn't make a good forecast. You know, that's that's a different question for a different day and probably more appropriate for the weather time scale and forecasting tomorrow's weather. But rather putting this in the context of all the possible outcomes here. So, yeah, the, the interpretation there, uh, the, the perspective of, oh, the forecast, a forecast wasn't made by your climate model, so therefore it's not reliable. That's... Uh, that's not the the way that we kind of look at this here. We look at this in terms of scenarios and the possibilities based upon them. So uh, I get your point. I understand the point that oh look, this is a this is a, something that didn't really play out in the model. But at the same time, the model did capture something along these lines. And 
what I'm looking at here are the range of possible outcomes with these orange curves that could have happened. And you're actually seeing that the range of outcomes that we did see was a plausible one, and that those plausible outcomes then navigate out to 2050. So this is a, it's kind of a complex argument that one has to make here. And if you have a question, please reach out to me. Um, and my email can be found here. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, uh, by, by any means, Andy is not making a forecast. He's showing scenarios of potential or possibility. Um, right. And according to the science and according to, um, yeah, uh, no model no model is perfect, not even the, the short-term weather models, as we all know. Um, it is, a, 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 I hate to say a tendency, but it is a leaning toward one direction or the other. Is that is can I say that, Andy? Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, that's a fair statement. Okay. All right, I'm going to get to some of the other comments and questions. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Kevin, uh, what was the rationale for recalculating the normals? Um, the normals for your hydrologic uh, information uh, for the last 30 years. Um, why do you do that? I, I did respond in here, say, uh, giving her a, a, a basic answer on climatology, but why, why would you say you guys do that? How does it help you? Sure, okay, um, and thanks for that question. So every month we put out uh, what, we're, what we think um, the rivers are going to do over the next three months. And we like to give folks an idea of how that fits with what normally occurs during that season. And we feel that uh, it's better to use a more current uh, normal computed over the past few years as opposed to using the entire period of record. Now, not all river forecast centers share that, that same uh, sentiment, but um, in the Missouri Basin, we think that we, we're, we're perceiving that things are changing. And so we believe that to put our current outlooks in the proper perspective, we should be uh, placing them in context of the most recent trends as opposed to the entire period of record. It's, it's a lot like what Doug wrote in his, in his response, but I hope that yeah. gives you a, an answer. Yeah, and, and that's why it's done um, in climatology generally. There are different sectors, like the energy sector, that doesn't want 30 or 50 years. They want, sometimes they want 15 years, sometimes, uh, because they want to know really recent uh, changes that are happening. It really depends on uh, what, what question you're trying to answer, to be honest, what your period of record for trend uh, matters. Kevin showed from 1895 to now, and I, I assure you, uh, if you looked over the last 10 years, which could be misleading, you would have a much different and much higher trend one way or the other. Um, that's simple statistical stuff. You can play with those all you want. Um, deciding which one is best for the Missouri River is tough, but as a world community of meteorologists and climatologists and hydrologists, for the most part, the 30 year period describes climate pretty well, uh, we think. Um, it's not always perfect, but it is a basis that we all work off of. Okay, um, yeah, and I think Brian, you had a comment about why, uh, oh, about the 4,000 plus stations that you used to show all the trends in drought and, 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 and uh, precipitation and precipitation plus temperature. Uh, there was a question about where are the where are all those that show no trend, and do you just want to chime in and talk about that really quickly? Yeah, that that was a good question. Uh, the graphics I showed did not include the no trend uh, points, just the the positive and negative, and so those points just didn't show up on on what I was showing. But it, yes, you are correct with your question that there are points that. Uh, were analyzed that do not have a trend one way or the other, positive or negative. They just did, were not on my graphics, and I apologize for that. Yep, thank you, Brian. Um, another question, thank you, Laura, good question. And um, does anyone have, uh, does, do, do any of the speakers 
have a comment about, and this might be you, uh, Kevin, duration of flooding or occurrence of flooding outside of peak snow melt season uh, in eastern South Dakota. In terms of, I think we're talking about in terms of trend. Yeah. Um, there's a perception, uh, it goes on to say, there's a perception of longer duration spring flooding uh, and or an increase in summer flooding in the James River in particular. So yeah, that whole Eastern Dakota's issue, if you will. Yeah, so I, I showed a slide earlier that compared 1979 to 20, um, 2012, I think it was, uh, that 33 year period versus the 1991 till 2020 30 year period and show that the volume, uh, the April through September volume has significantly increased. And so I, I think that sort of points to that, that that is evidence that the volume uh, has increased and rivers like the Red River, the North and the James, you know, they're flat. <laughs> so it, it takes a long time to translate that water out of the system. So if you if you got more volume to work with, uh, it, it seems, um, you know, intuitive that, it's, uh, that the duration of the high water event is going to last longer. Um, so that that sort of would be my response to it, that I think there is evidence that we've got more water to deal with in the James. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's a lot of things pointing to that part of the country. And I don't know, Andy, if you want to say anything about any particular part of the Missouri Basin behaving differently than any other part. I know you mostly looked at north and south, basically. Um, but you, as well as all of us, have seen the east-west, uh, east-west, if you will, dichotomy of uh, changes in uh, stream flow and precipitation, for that matter. Anything you want to say about yeah, me? Yeah. Yeah, if you could give me um, the opportunity to share my slides again. Sure, while I take it away from Kevin. Um, <laughs> there we go. That's okay. <laughs> All right, I think you guys can see it, at least my hope. Um, yeah, so here, so these are the precipitation differences between the recent 30 years and the prior 30 years. And they really get at the quote unquote trends during those time periods. So. You look here at down in the southwest, what we've seen is a decreasing trend in precipitation, whether that's natural or it's mostly natural that uh, that our community is really highlighted. You're seeing that as well in the Pacific, in the northwestern parts of the Missouri Basin. The exceptional precipitation increases are here in North Dakota and South Dakota and Nebraska, and even into western Iowa and these extreme southwestern parts of Minnesota. These are these the areas here we're seeing predominantly springtime precipitation leading to spring and summertime runoff. Those exceptional years that are really feeding into the flows that are measured at Sioux City. So it's really this area right here that is seeing the exceptional precip that's really winning the day regarding the increases in runoff between the recent year and a prior period. And as I showed previously, it was really those exceptional years that are winning the day, day even for those multi-decadal periods. Okay. Um, I'll open it up to anybody on the panel uh, if you have any other comments or um, issues you'd like to uh, bring up, please do, or any caveats to anything you said. Feel free. Okay. Um, I'll ask you one last question, Andy. Uh, what's the next step in, in, in being more... Uh, the next step in the Missouri Basin in terms of uh, research along these lines, or are we done for the most part until the next major event occurs? <laughs> <laughs> well, really it's, it's the, it, I, I see it as a spring, a winter and spring precipitation extreme um, situation where this has really been the common thread through the work that we've done here and the common thread through a lot of the stuff that we're seeing that Kevin and, and Mike and Brian have presented. 
And really why, what I want to do is I want to get to the bottom of that, both from sort of the weather scale all the way up to the seasonal scale and how that can shed insights on how river flows might change in the future. So remember when I was showing these most likely outcomes for um, October to September and climate models, that's for the entire water year. That's not for individual times of the year. So the individual times of the year, maybe we're going to see an increased prevalence of flooding and precipitation and high runoff related to climate change. And it's really getting down to that seasonality. It may be stretching a little bit of uh, the capabilities of our climate models because they aren't so good at getting down to those really finer features. But until we test that, uh, we won't know with, with any definitive nature. Okay. Yep, and uh, as um, one of our uh, commenters says, thank you all for great presentations, uh, very insightful and thought provoking. And I am sure not the last word uh, on this subject for any of us. Um, those interested, I'll be sending out a invitation to a, if you will, special, uh, extra, whatever you wanna call it, um, webinar for July 6th. I know that's not the best time in the world, but on July 6th, we'll be having a North Central wide webinar just to sum up the, the conditions because we're sort of getting a little dry across uh, a lot of the area in the Midwest and, and not so much in the Plains, but um, in, in across at least halfway through the Dakotas. Um, that'll be July 6th at 1 p.m. Central. And then, of course, our usual webinar on July 20th with uh, Trent. Um, Trent, I always forget his last name. Our, our state climatologist from Illinois. Um, how do I do that? Anyway, anyway. His name is Trent Ford, and his, Trent he's Ford, a very bright guy. And he's a really like his presentation. Trent Ford. Yes, he, he's quite famous. Thank you very much. I always have a bad memory. And for some reason, I have a different name in my mind. Um, but anyway, thank you all. Have a good afternoon. And if you, uh, we will get this uh, put up if you will, online and make the PDFs available uh, at some point in some place. I just don't have a, a, the place designated right now. And thanks to all the speakers one more time. Thank you all. Very good.